think that extraordinary treatment is bad, that it's forbidden, that's not true. It's optional. It's not obligatory, but it's optional. We'll go into that. Uh, one very important point that has to be understood is that if you omit treatment with the intent to bring about death, then that is just as much euthanasia in Catholic teaching as if you give somebody a lethal injection. So if you have the intent to cause death, this is not the way the law looks at it, but in Catholic teaching and ethics, that is regarded as uh, euthanasia just as much as if you had given a lethal injection. Uh, we do have to distinguish accepting a foreseen risk of death, the so-called principle of the double effect. Now, uh, there is this issue of what is extraordinary treatment versus what is ordinary treatment. And as we'll see, there are a couple of key aspects to this. One relates to the proportionality of uh, weighing the prospect of success against the, um, the risks, uh, side effects, and, and other aspects of the potential treatment. Then there's an aspect that talks about what is reasonably expectable as opposed to what goes above and beyond what is reasonably con is expected of you, uh, what is considered to be extraordinarily burdensome and therefore not required. Uh, and then there is the issue of uh, uh, not providing treatment when you are dealing with imminent death from terminal illness. But there is a very important other aspect, and that is the recognition that there's a certain category of normal care that is always required, uh, and that this includes so-called artificial provision of food and fluids. So let's begin with this really central point about the clash between the culture of life and the culture of death. Uh, in his encyclical uh, Faith and Reason uh, in 1998, Pope John Paul II pointed out that theology has always had to respond in different historical moments to the demands of different cultures in order then to mediate the content of faith to those cultures in a coherent and conceptually clear way. And sometimes the tendency of the culture will be in one direction, and the church has to stand clearly against the excesses and evils of that. And sometimes the tendency of the age will be perhaps in the exact opposite direction, and then the church has to stand against those. And in fact, if you study uh, heresies very frequently, you know, the heresy will always be on one extreme or the other. Uh, Christ is God only and only in the form of man, uh, or Christ is, is man only, adop, you know, adopted by God, but not truly God. And then uh, uh, the, the church has to clarify, no, God is both, uh, Christ is both God and man, uh, two natures in one, uh, one being. Now, uh, John Paul II points out, pointed out in his encyclical, uh, The Gospel of Life, Evangelium Vitae, that one of the more alarming symptoms of the culture of death sees the growing number of elderly and disabled people as intolerable and too burdensome. A hopelessly impaired life no longer has any value. And of course he's describing the, what is the unacceptable culture of death. And one of the points, I really want to emphasize this because it goes to what Laura was speaking about when she said talking was in the family. She said, you know, John Paul II said, we need to begin with the renewal of a culture of life within Christian communities themselves. Too often it happens that believers, even those who take an active part in the life of the church, end up by separating their Christian faith from its ethical requirements concerning life, and thus fall into moral subjectivism and certain objectionable ways of acting. And what Pope John Paul II was pointing out was that Christians are influenced by the culture. Uh, you know, as the example that was given about the writer's drinking. Uh, Christians, the culture of death, the quality of life, I think, is so pervasive that it's very easy sometimes for us to slip into sort of ex accepting quality of life considerations as a way, and we say, oh, well, because of these quality of life considerations, certain treatment is extraordinary. Uh, so we have to be very careful, uh, we, as, as the Pope went on to say, with great openness and courage, we need to question how widespread is the culture of life today among individual Christians. Uh, with equal clarity and determination, we must identify the steps we are called to take in order to serve life in all its proof. In other words, we have to be prepared to reject what the world teaches us with regard to the culture of death and the quality of life ethic and uh, understand the extent to which we have been uh, responding to that pervasive uh, impact of the culture. And in fact, it's interesting, um, one theologian wrote in response to the Pope's allocution, which we'll come to in a moment, where he emphasized 
that food and fluids are always ordinary care, always basic care. Many regard what the Pope said as upsetting the status quo of American health care, including mm -hmm. in Catholic hospitals. While that may be true, that ought not to be taken necessarily as a criticism of the Pope. If the Pope's allocution is regarded as a course correction for the Catholic tradition, and if the initial reactions to it are any, are any indication, there would appear to be much hard work that has to be done, much teaching or perhaps better reteaching will have to take place. And really, this is the critical point that I want to try to emphasize, that if one follows the teaching of John Paul II in particular, in developing uh, the, the ethic of treatment, we will realize that we have to reject a lot of things that have been assumed, even by sometimes quite orthodox theologians, about uh, understanding what treatment, the, the obligations to provide treatment, or the circumstances in which you legitimately can reject it. So the first, very most fundamental point is that the quality of life of a patient is not an acceptable factor in deciding whether or not to provide that patient life-saving medical treatment. Okay? So um, what the, the Pope said in, in an allocution to a, a Congress in Rome dealing with the quality of life and the ethics of health care uh, at, at a time very close to his death, he wrote, or he uh, rather said in, the, in his uh, speech, in his allocution, preference is being given to a notion of quality of life that would consist in the ability to enjoy and experience pleasure, or even in the capacity for self-awareness and participation in social life. As a result, human beings who are not yet or are no longer able to understand and desire or those who can no longer enjoy life with sensations and relations are denied every form of quality of life. And it's important to realize what he's responding to here. You know, there's sort of the secular quality of life ethic. And that's the one that says, for example, if you're no longer able to communicate with others, okay, if your Alzheimer's has advanced to a such an extent, or if you're in a so-called persistent vegetative state, um, then you know, your quality of life is really gone. You're really no longer a person. Mm -hmm. Well, there's sort of a, what you might call a baptized quality of life method. And that's one that sort of starts out by saying, well, you know, we have to realize that while life Biological human life is a good, it is not the ultimate good. The ultimate good is to know, love, and serve God. And if you are no longer capable, because of your mental deterioration, of knowing, loving, and serving God, then there's no longer any further point to your life. And therefore, and this has been argued by some Catholic theologians, therefore any treatment that would preserve your life at all, if you're in that condition, is extraordinary treatment and need not be provided even giving you warmth in, in bed, okay? Well, this is what the Pope is responding to, that, that trend of thought. And um, he emphasized very specifically uh, in his teaching and in his allocutions that even a person in a so-called vegetative state is still under the watchful eye of God and still is to be regarded as a member of the human race, as a brother and a sister, as a child of God. Uh, now, the other point is, as, as he said in his, his March 2004 allocution, is to admit that decisions regarding man's life can be based on an external acknowledgement of its quality is the same as acknowledging that increasing and decreasing levels of quality of life and therefore of human dignity can be attributed from an external perspective to any subject thus introducing into social relations a discriminatory and eugenic principle. And what do we constantly hear about nowadays? You know, about how we're wasting all this money on preserving the lives of people uh, who, you know, really are not able to communicate or really not able to contribute. Well, the Pope said, no evaluation of cause can outweigh the value of the fundamental good which we are trying to protect, that of human life. So it's important to recognize that the Pope clearly enunciated his Catholic teaching that quality of life cannot be a factor in determining the, the value of a person or whether or not we're going to give life-saving medical treatment to that person. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bishop's Pro-Life Committee proposed what I think is a very helpful sort of examination of conscience when we are ourselves making decisions about treatment for ourselves or treatment perhaps for our family <coughs> members. And that is, that a means that is considered ordinary or proportionate for other patients should not be considered extraordinary or disproportionate for severely impaired patients 
solely because of a judgment that their lives are not worth living. Okay? And this is where the, the point that I was referring to earlier, uh, John Paul II, talking about the sick person in a vegetative state uh, still has the right to basic health care and to the prevention of complications related to his confinement to bed. He also has the right to appropriate rehabilitative care and to be monitored for clinical signs of eventual recovery. Now notice very carefully what the Pope was talking about here. A lot of people talk about this allocution as saying, oh, well, that means you have to give food and fluids. The Pope certainly is emphasizing that, but he's, that's not all he's emphasizing. He's saying that that person is entitled to appropriate rehabilitative care and to be monitored for the possibility that the patient might be able to recover and that you provide appropriate medical care in that context as well. So, if I can rephrase this a little bit as a suggested examination of conscience test. Let's suppose that the patient, instead of being someone with a cognitive disability, advanced Alzheimer's disease, for example, or an 80-year-old grandmother, were a very young sport tooling around in a mustache, okay, but was stricken with the same illness, would the treatment be withheld in that case? And if the answer is no, we would give treatment to that 20-year-old, then you can't say, well, we're not going to give it to grandma. It's extraordinary for her. Okay? Now, the next point, we're going to get into a, in, in a moment the critical issue of what is the standard for determining what treatment is extraordinary and what is optional. But for, uh, excuse me, what is extraordinary and what is ordinary. But very, very important point, and that is that extraordinary treatment is not forbidden. It is optional. In the Declaration on Euthanasia that was issued, uh, by the Vatican, uh, it is permitted, says, it is permitted with the patient's consent to have recourse to the means provided by the most advanced medical techniques, even if these means are still at the experimental stage and are not without a certain risk. By accepting them, the patient can even show generosity in the service of humanity. And it, it, what does that mean? Well, for example, by definition, an experimental treatment, one that's not normally given to people with this, is an extraordinary treatment. Okay? But if we never had anybody who ever took experimental treatments, medicine would never progress. Okay? So clearly it cannot be wrong to get extraordinary treatment, a treatment above and beyond that that you are obliged to get. Okay. Now another very, very critically important point. You know, in the law, there is a clear legal distinction between uh, what the law characterizes in the United States as a right to reject treatment uh, and on the other hand, what in most states the law says is illegal, and that is giving a lethal injection to somebody or a lethal prescription to someone. But from an ethical standpoint, uh, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that by euthanasia is understood an action or an omission, which of itself, because of the nature of what is being done or omitted, or by intention causes death in order that all suffering may in this way be eliminated. Now this is very, very important point to understand. Understand that you cannot will death as an end or even as a means. All right? Now think about this for a minute. It's a good thing to want to go to heaven, right? And it's a good thing to want to be with God. And it's a good thing to want your relatives and your friends to do the same thing. But suppose you knew somebody who is a real rapscallion, who is constantly falling into very serious sin and endangering his or her immortal soul. And you just happen to be coming back from hunting, and you see that person walking out of the confessional, and you say, boy, you know, I know this guy. He's going to relapse. He's going to relapse into mortal sin. Right now, he's pure. So I'm going to shoot him, right? so that he can go to heaven. Because isn't it, it's far more important that he goes to heaven, right? Than, than we just have our fun. Well, I, I hope it's clear that that's wrong. <laughs> well, understand, what this is saying is, that's also, it's also unacceptable to say, we're going to withhold this treatment so grandma can go to God. Okay? She's lived her life, you know, she's, she's got, at the end of her life now, and, and so, Let's not give her that antibiotic because, you know, God is calling her and, and we just want to let her go to God and that's better, isn't it? Okay. That is the, if that is the reason, if you are willing, if the reason that you are doing this, the reason that you are rejecting this treatment, whether it's extraordinary treatment or ordinary treatment, 
The reason you're saying no to it is because you want to bring about the person's death even for a supposedly pious reason. You know, we want the person to be, go to heaven or, you know, we want the person not to, to have suffering. And in order to do that, we're going to use death as the means. That is absolutely forbidden. That is euthanasia. And it's just as much as if you shot that person coming out of the confessional. Okay? Now, there is a difference, and it's an important one, between an intent to die and a foreseen but not intended possibility of death. And let me give you an illustration. All of us came to this convention by some means of transportation. We drove, certainly, right? Some of us flew. Now, you know, certainly you're aware of the fact, that every time you go out in your car, you are risking death, right? There are automobile accidents and there are fatal automobile accidents every day. And even though it's less likely to happen, we all hear about airplane crashes, right? And people dying in the airplane crashes, okay? Now, when you got in your car to come to this convention, you may very well, whether it was in the forefront of your mind or not, been aware of the fact that by doing so, you were increasing your risk of death. But were you getting in that car and driving this convention in order to die? I certainly hope not. Okay. And the point is that there is a genuine and very important difference between doing something for a good purpose, we hope coming to this convention is a good purpose, all right, and nevertheless realizing that there is a foreseen risk of death associated with this. Okay. And ethically, that is not the same thing. Now, if, if you go into your car and you drive it off a 100-foot cliff, okay, the odds are pretty clear that you're doing that in order to commit suicide. <clears throat> Even if there's some infinitesimal chance that the car is going to you know, land on some trees and you're not going to be killed. So there's a point at which, of itself, it's clear that the action that's going on is one that is uh, ordered to bringing about death and is unacceptable. So what does this mean? Well, let's go back to the Bishop's Pro-Life Committee. It says, here's an, what, what I'm calling an examination of conscience test. When you're making a decision about whether to forego or take life-saving medical treatment for yourself or on behalf of somebody else, ask yourself, honestly, you know, this is an examination of conscience, what am I trying to achieve by doing it? We must be sure that it is not our intent to cause the patient's death either for its own sake or as a means to achieving some other goal, such as the relief of suffering. Okay? So you need to honestly ask yourself, what is your intent in making this decision? All right. And put it another way, would the treatment be wealth held in spite of or because of the prospect that this would increase the risk of death? In other words, you, there may be a legitimate reason, which we'll get to in a moment, to say that we're not going to provide this particular treatment. But, but if you're saying, and, and, and it may be that we recognize that there's a good chance that not giving it might result in death, but if you would be very, very glad, if you would really want it to be the case, that despite the fact that this treatment wasn't provided, the patient lived, okay, as opposed to being disappointed, then there's an indication that you're not doing it in order to bring about the person's death. All right. Well, let's suppose that you, and this is, these really, I would say these two things are probably the most important lessons that it's important to learn, that it's critical to learn here for purposes of examination of conscience. Because we, we have to be very, very careful to root out any of that, and it's very hard given the culture that's around us, any of the notion that, well, because, you know, my aunt is suffering from Alzheimer's disease and advanced dementia, and, you know, it's very difficult to care for her, you know, well, maybe really it's her time to go. Isn't God calling her? And so we shouldn't give her this antibiotic, or we shouldn't give, keep providing her this food, these food and foods. Okay? We have to resist that, and we have to be very, very careful not to be intending to bring about somebody's death, uh, our own or someone else's, uh, through the means, even for a, quote, good end. But then we get down to the issue. Let's suppose that we really are carefully not using quality of life criteria. We really are not intending to bring about death. Then we come to this issue of you know, are we held to consider you know, every conceivable means that might be used to preserve someone's life? And the answer to that, the Catholic Church teaches, is no. And it says euthanasia must be distinguished. This is from uh, Pope John Paul, the, uh, 
is the second uh, gospel of life encyclical. From the decision to forego so-called aggressive medical treatment. In other words, now listen to this carefully, because a lot of people can jump on the first thing and not, and read it out of context, suddenly say, oh, well, this is a basis for rejecting all sorts of treatment. In other words, medical procedures which no longer correspond to the real situation of the patient, either, and you notice there are two standards here, because they are by now disproportionate to any expected results, or because they impose an excessive burden on the patient or his family. Well, let's look at those because they're the two distinct issues. Okay? Now, what does it mean to say that a particular treatment is disproportionate? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that virtually all the time, whenever we're making, that there are exceptions, but virtually all the time, whenever one is dealing with treatments, one is balancing all sorts of things. There are typically, you know, there are different types, options for treatment. Sometimes some sorts of treatment are more aggressive, sometimes some are more conservative. But with virtually any treatment, there are risks, okay? So, for example, let's suppose that someone has uh, a leg that is infected, okay, with, with gangrene perhaps, all right? And let's suppose there may be two different possible ways of treating that. One way might be of providing, let's say, antibiotics that has, let's say, a 30% chance of preventing the death by gangrene. Amputation, on the other hand, might have a 90% chance of, pre pre of preventing death by gangrene. But the surgery might itself have a 10% risk of death. Okay? Now, I'm pulling these. I don't want you to go back and say this is a good description of what the actual risks are with regard to a gangrenous leg. I'm not a doctor and I'm pretending to be. But I'm trying to give this as an illustration. And the point is that it is, it is within the realm of legitimate, shall we say, options, probably in that case to go either way. Assuming that you are not saying, well, we're not going to give the antibiotics and instead we're going to cut off the leg because, boy, we really hope somebody with Alzheimer's, we really hope they'll die on the operating table. You're not saying that, but you're trying to weigh, weigh and balance the risks versus the benefits. You could probably legitimately say, go either way and say, yes, we'll go ahead and do the operation, or no, we'll try to go with the antibiotics. Okay? If, because what you're doing is you are trying to weigh and balance the risks, the side effects on the one hand against the prospect of benefit on the other. And this is something that we do all the time. Um, you know, this is not unique to medicine. I mean, th these are decisions we make all the time in our days. For example, you know, sh how far should we drive to try to pick up uh, a, a new computer or, or something for our homes in comparison to going closer for something that's probably not exactly what we want, but it's easier to get to, okay? All the time, we make these judgments about proportion, weighing and balancing the, the advantages and the disadvantages. And this is legitimate. Now, um, the other issue is the question of, quote, what is an undue burden? What is an extraordinary burden? And what the Evangelium Vitae says is, certainly there is a moral obligation to care for oneself and to allow to oneself to be cared for, but this duty must take account of concrete circumstances. Okay, uh, now part of this is this issue of proportionality. It needs to be determined whether the means of treatment available are objectively proportioned to the prospects for improvement. That's what we've been talking about so far. Okay, and, and this other point is on this, but the, the burdensomeness issue. Pius XII, in an often cited alloca uh, allocution, said normally one is held to use only ordinary means to prolong life. Now listen to this closely. <coughs> according to the circumstances of persons, places, times, and culture. That is to say, means that do not involve any grave burdens for oneself or another. Now, it's very important to understand what exactly is meant by this, okay? Uh, we can go back to uh, theologians who wrote at a time when modern medicine was not really as developed as today, distinguishing between a common diligence to which we are obliged and a singular assiduity to which we are not held. So, for example, a man is not bound to seek a more healthful and wholesome locality and air in order to prolong his life. Okay? The issue that was talked about before 
you know, if you, can, you, can you live in Los Angeles where the air is polluted? Or do you have an obligation in order to save, preserve your life, you know, to go up to the area of Canada where there's, you know, very little air pollution? Now, what does this mean? Well, it's very important to realize that this issue of what is ordinary versus extraordinary is not something that is unique to treatment decisions. For example, Catholics know that there is an obligation to attend Mass on Sunday and Holy Days of Obligation, right? That is an obligation. It's a moral sin not to do it. But, but, one is only held to do, take ordinary efforts in order to fulfill that obligation. So, for example, to take an extreme example, dial back a couple hundred years, and you've got pioneers who are out in the plain, only can travel by wagons, uh, you know, no automobiles or anything like that. Maybe there's a train. And the nearest Catholic church is 100 miles away. Okay? Now, would it be possible, it might be possible, to travel that 100 miles and back every Sunday? But it's beyond what is reasonably expectable. Okay? So there's no duty, or suppose that you're traveling and it is extremely difficult to get to a church for mass. Okay? This is, you are not held to do to require, take extraordinary efforts. Now, what is, you know, there's no mathematical calculation that determines what is an ordinary versus an extraordinary effort. Let me give you an illustration uh, that is out from from the, the, the context of Catholic ethics, but I think we'll get the point across. I hope we'll get the point across. Um, in grocery stores, there are often what are known as slip and fall cases. And that's when, let's suppose, especially if the lettuce and the other vegetables are not all in plastic wrappers, uh, it's in the nature of things that, let's say, you know, pieces of lettuce may fall off from the produce and fall on the floor, and an unwary customer might go along and slip on it and fall and break a leg. Okay? Now let's suppose that that happens and the grocery store is sued. Will the grocery store have an obligation to pay, uh, you know, to make whole that individual? Well, here's the point. Uh, the grocery store has a duty of care that is an ordinary duty of care to keep the aisle clean. So if on the one hand, if you hit the, the grocery store paid somebody to push a broom all the way uh, across this aisle and at the end of the aisle turn around and push the broom all the way back and as that person is doing that, you know, full eight hours every day, a lettuce leaf falls behind the person and somebody comes and slips on it. Well, very clearly, the grocery store is not going to be held liable. On the other hand, if you have a grocery store that's really slovenly, and only sweeps the aisles, let's say, every two weeks, then there's a good chance that it will be held liable. Now, where in between those two extremes is a jury going to determine, well, they're sweeping the floor enough or they're not? Well, it depends on all sorts of things. It depends upon what is most commonly done by other grocery stores, okay? Uh, it, it, what seems to be reasonable under the circumstances. And, and that's the sort of obligation that we're talking about. If, if my grandmother, ha if Vladimir Putin in Russia has a very rare heart condition and the specialists at the Kremlin have come up with some treatment for Vladimir Putin that hasn't made it out anywhere beyond the Kremlin hospital, but my aunt in, uh, uh, in Iowa has the same condition, do I have an obligation to make sure I get her on a plane and take her to Moscow and pound on the gates of the Kremlin Hospital in order to get her the treatment. No, I don't. Okay. Um, on the other hand, however, it's important to recognize that two things. First of all, it wouldn't be wrong for me to do that. That would be extraordinary. It would be optional. Okay, it wouldn't be wrong. But the other thing important to understand is that things that are commonly available and commonly done uh, in your location, okay, if you're in a big city, if you're in Jacksonville as opposed to what people always talk about, you know, uh, a, a hut in Africa, okay, there's a okay. different standard for what type of treatment is commonly and ordinarily provided. And in this context, let me say one thing very quickly because a lot of people have the impression that respirators are by definition extraordinary treatment. And that's simply wrong. It's wrong because respirators are now something that is commonly provided 
in hospitals and circumstances all the time. Why do people have this impression? Well, in the 1950s, does anybody remember or remember reading about the uh, polio epidemics? And you remember seeing the pictures of the children in the iron lungs? Okay. Well, those were you know experimental new treatments, ventilators. And there were theologians who wrote in the early 50s and gave that as an example of something that was extraordinary treatment. Well, in the 1950s, that was extraordinary treatment. Okay? But just as, you know, in, when Louis Pasteur was first coming up with, with uh, uh, vaccinations and so forth, uh, in the 19th century, common vaccinations would be unusual and extraordinary, but they're now commonplace. So also, you know, the standard of what is ordinary medical care changes and evolves. Now, we're getting to the point where if we're going to let you have the opportunity to ask any questions of Lori or myself, I really need to draw this to a close. So let me just uh, make a quick point. I'm not going to go into this imminent inevitable death circumstance because I think Lori explained that pretty clearly. Uh, I'll simply say, underline the fact that the, the Pope made very clear that the normal care that is always obligatory includes the provision of food and fluids, uh, even by so-called artificial means. Uh, and this is true for people regardless of whether they're in a so-called persistent vegetative state or, or not. Basic health care is always required. Um, and I should say that the document, the information that I'm providing here that you'll see up on this, uh, we had hoped, we had planned to have a handout that was it sort of miscarried. And what I'm going to ask actually, is Jennifer here? No. Oh, well, the moderator, perhaps you could begin to pass this out. Anyone who would like to have uh, a compilation uh, of quotations uh, of Catholic teaching, uh, primarily but not exclusively from John Paul II, please just put your email address down there and we'll make sure that you, that you get this. So I will just sort of finally summarize by saying, what are the tests? Well, we have to ask, is the patient permanently ill with death imminent? Or could the person, patient live indefinitely but with a disability? In the latter case, you know, you really don't have an excuse for not providing life-saving medical treatment. Is the treatment proportionate? This is this issue of how do we weigh and balance the risks versus the benefits. Is it burdensome beyond what is reasonably expectable under the circumstances of time and place, you know, flying off to the Kremlin? Uh, or is it something that is commonly and ordinarily given? And remember that. Uh, the issue also is that normal care, including food and fluids, must always be given. And let's go back to those two really critically important tests to really examine your own consciences. And that is, if this patient, instead of being someone with a disability or 80 years old, were this very young sport tooling around in a Mustang with the same illness, needing the same treatment, would the treatment be withheld? And if you honestly have to say, no, we wouldn't withheld it there, then you can't suddenly say, oh, guess what? This treatment is extraordinary when we're talking about grandma. Uh, and finally, and very, very importantly, again, would the treatment be withheld in spite of double intent, uh, or because, double effect, I should say, or because of the prospect that this would increase the risk of death? And if it's the latter, you know that it's certainly wrong. Well, with that, let's uh, turn it over to your, your questions. Now, remember, what, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you're able to do it, is to come up to the line up behind the microphone so this is all being taped. While you're walking, I want to emphasize something that Brooke just said. He just